Okay. Hello. Hi. What is up, Read You Guest Nation? Gamers, gamies, everything in between. Hello. My name is Reed at Read You Guess on Twitter. Today, I am here to do my sacred Australian duty and give you a completely insane recap of Just Roll With It, Riptide. Firstly, I feel the need to say that this video is pretty heavily inspired by Mike's Mike's, a completely unhinged recap of Pretty Little Liars, of Glee. He's just an icon. There's a bunch of these kind of things out there. Um, and here I am doing it for the incredibly niche hit D&D podcast because I have uni assignments to do that I do not want to do. So surprisingly, the hardest part about this video was fucking getting a filming setup and finding a plain white wall in my house. For those of you who do not know, Just Roll With It or JRWI is a hit D&D podcast featuring the four fantastic people, Grizzly Plays, Conda Fiction, Bisley Channel and Charlie Slimesicle. There's also been a bunch of special guests on the show. You've had Joe Cat, you've had Jay Schlatt, you've had Rambu, you've had fucking... Jonah Scott? Jonah Scott was on the podcast? And before you guys ask, yes, I was going to wear a pirate costume, but then it looked fucking dumb, and so I'm not going to do that anymore. Also, it's red, and my hair is blue. Those colours do not go together. And today, we will be covering all of Riptide. I feel like this kind of goes without saying, but this video will contain spoilers for all of Riptide up to 81 because that is the episode that's currently last published. Um, obviously, there'll probably be more episodes out before this goes up, um, but that is the last episode that is currently out. So yeah, this will contain spoilers for all of that. Um, I have split it up into arcs, and we will be going in chronological order. So um, if you've only watched it to a certain point, you should be able to watch like, most of this video. I've got these like bits of paper uh, with the arc on it. So if there's an arc that you haven't watched when I show up the bit of paper, you can just stop the video. It's, it's as simple as that. As for the format of this video, I have broken it up into arcs, which will be going on this side of the wall, and characters, which will be going on this side of the wall. As this is an appropriately insane recap of Just Roll With It Riptide, um, I have decided that as well as documenting the key plot points, both for our main trio of characters and each arc of the show, I will also be highlighting the most insane, unhinged and honestly out of pocket moments of the show. Again, both for the main trio and for each arc. So look forward to that because I forgot some of these things happened and let's just say Limonade is like the brink of it. Those of you who do not know what Just Roll With It is or have not watched Just Roll With It, hi, welcome. I'm glad I could be your introduction here. That's pretty fucking sick. Riptide is a story uh, presented in the D&D 5e format, and I here have written out a little description of the campaign for you. Riptide is based in the world of Mana, pretty much Earth, but with a lot more water. It follows the story of the Riptide pirates, who we have up here, Gillian, Tyshrider, Jay Farron, and Chip Bastard. As they set sail through Mana, each with their own goals, Chip trying to reunite his childhood pirate crew, Gillian to try and fulfill his destiny, and Jay trying to find her own path. But often, they tend to try and create more issues than they solve. That's pretty much it, I think, for the introduction. So for context, by the way, um, I feel like it's required to let you guys know that Just Roll With It, Riptide, is 120 hours long. For context, Pretty Little Liars is 96 hours long, and Glee is 80 hours long. Right, right, right. Right. So, without further ado, and pun completely intended, let's just roll with it. In order to understand the story of Riptide, we first have to go back 10 years to the story of the Black Rose, the prequel one-shots. Now, our characters. Let's, let's get into this. Let's get crazy. So we are introduced to three characters. We introduced to Dre Ferrin. He is the uncle of Jay Ferrin um, and is also known as Sure Shot. He, I believe, was the navigator. I could be wrong though. I can't quite remember. His keywords are Sure Shot, Sick Ass Ponytail, 
and the gun. I fucking hate blue tack. Dre Ferrin. Next, we are introduced to Finn Tidestrider. Finn Tidestrider is the grandfather, I believe, of Gillian Tidestrider up there. Um, he is a writer. He likes to study the ocean. He is from the undersea. The undersea, we are told. I imagine like Atlantis, a shark's tail, Barbie Mermadia, you know, that kind of shit. It's like a village under the water. A village, a kingdom under the water where all the water races live. Things like Tritons, which is this motherfucker. Things like Water Genesi and Grung and all of those other like cool water races. They all live under there. Fin Tide Strider. Keywords are Fishman, Cool Mustache, and Canonically Fucks. That's true. He does. And we are reminded of it very often. Last but not least, we are introduced to Arlen James. He is the adoptive father of Chip down here. Um, he is, again, another member of the Black Rose. Physically very burly and boisterous. He has sick-ass wave tattoos like run up his body. His keywords are terrible father figure, cool tattoos, and hunk of meat. And I honestly, I'm not wrong with that. Like, come on, let's face it. Okay, now we have the three main cast of the Black Rose one-shot. Other notable NPCs, uh, we have Rufus the dog, we have a very young uh, child, Chip, and we also have uh, a girl the same age as Chip called Lizzie Lafayette. That's pretty much all you need to know context-wise. So into the plot, oh my god, shit is crazy. Okay, so onto the Black Rose one-shots. We are introduced to our three main bitches, Dre, Finn, and Arlen. And we are pretty much told that they have been sailing with the Black Rose for like a good few years. Their captain is about to retire. He's going to go home, settle down, have a kid. They're all having a nice big celebration. We are told about the existence of, and I quote, the piss dolphin and the elusive crawfish. This is a bit that goes on for about 10 minutes about a piss dolphin and the elusive crawfish, out of which Dre claims that the elusive crawfish has never been found because then it wouldn't be elusive. But then Finn is like, well, no, I've obviously seen one. It's in my fucking book. So that brings us to our first point, which is the piss dolphin and the elusive crawfish. Putting this one on the wall. They're all celebrating, getting all excited because, you know, big party. We introduced it to Chip and Lizzie via a hot dog eating contest. We are pretty much told that they are like siblings, adoptive siblings. They love each other very much. They're like very, you know, at each other's throats kind of relationship. We also have some very nice scenes where we see that Arlen is a very strong father figure to Chip. We learn that Arlen basically found Chip on a dock somewhere and his name is Chip because he tried to say the word ship and didn't quite do it right. And so his name is just Chip now and he's basically kidnapped on this pirate boat. But he's having a great time, so who really cares? In the middle of this celebration, however, things are pretty heavily taken to a stop as big ass tentacles take over the boat. Now some of you may be thinking that's kind of hot and sexy. And I can assure you that is not what the Black Rose thought as their ship was fucking destroyed by big ass tentacles big ass tentacles that's going on the wall oh shit big ass tentacles and we see that their captain gets killed and overtaken by this black sludge that is like coming out of his eyes and his mouth and i believe it's dre or arlen that has to kill him but they pretty much kill that captain which i don't know if you know this about pirates that's a pretty big no-no but remember this black sludge this black sludge is important for later. And the black rose is pretty much taken into this big ass whirlpool in the middle of this ocean. This whirlpool is like black. This is something that, that has never been seen before at all. Something sussy is pretty obviously up. So we've got big ass hole in the sea. They're taken in by this whirlpool, dragged to the bottom of the ocean. There's like a room with this cool sick ass black and gold pearl in it. I don't know. And then pretty much we are just told that they disappear. Um, earlier, I think Chip was thrown over the side of the ship and kind of all we know, the only survivor of the Black Rose incident is Chip. And this incident goes down in history, kind of only carried on through word of mouth. It's kind of just this story now. Like people forget about it. Um, 
And so we close off the Black Rose one-shots with Bye Bye Black Rose. Main points, main takeaways here is that Arlen is the adoptive father of Chip. Arlen, Finn, and Dre are on this boat. This boat is taken down into the ocean, um, leaving Chip abandoned. Everyone thinks these three are dead, apart from Chip, and no one knows really what happened. My voice is already starting to hurt, and I'm 25 minutes into this. We can start on the main plot. At the beginning of this story, we are introduced to the world of mana. I think I've pronounced that four different ways at this point. My only excuse is that I'm Australian and that our A's kind of don't really work properly. We open out with our three main characters, Gillian Tidestrider, Jay Farron, and Chip, unknown last name, adoptive last name, Bastard, Gillian. Also known as Gillian Tidestrider, Champion of the Undersea, Hero Paramount of the Deep, Champion, Pigeon Nitro Lord, the Julian, One, Friend Warrior of Rocket Roll, Super Sly, and Eden Grass, Tidestrider, Brother of Dugan. Moisture Master, Horse Tamer, Defenestrator of the Adopt. Gillian is a Triton from the Undersea, uh, earlier explained, City Under the Sea, and we learn that he is the proclaimed Chosen One, and we find out that he has a destiny that was set by the Elders of this Undersea. This prophecy and what he is necessarily chosen for is a bit of a mystery. He doesn't really talk about it, it's kind of just this he is the chosen one, as classic D&D is. He is very new to the Oversea and doesn't quite know what's going on or how to interact. His keywords are fishman, ignorant, and destiny. Other fun Gillian fact, he is canonically barefoot all of the time and we do not talk about that enough. Put your dogs away, man. Come on. We are then introduced to Jay Farron. Jay Farron is an ex-Navy soldier. She comes from a family that's pretty high up in the Navy. I think one of the, if not the top family in the Navy. She is a girl boss, firstly. Her and her mom used to live, or well, do currently live, prior to getting on a pirate ship on a small island. Her mom owned an inn. They were still with the Navy. There are like two factions, pretty much. You have the Navy and everyone else. The Navy is like the government, but bad. Jay wants to find her sister. That is her goal. We learn that her sister just disappeared. We don't quite know where she is. Her keywords are ginger, girl boss, and OMG, hi, 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 um, hello, hi. Then we have Chip, Chip Bastard. Uh, Chip is a pirate, ex-childhood pirate of the Black Rose. He isn't quite ready to get rid of that. He spends most of his time putting together his own pirate crew, trying to relive the days of the Black Rose, trying to find the Black Rose. All he really wants is to find Arlen James. Whether Arlen James is alive or not is a different question, but along the way, he picks up as many people as he possibly can and honestly just causes a bit of a mess. Chip is a bastard. He's a scoundrel. He's a rogue. That's kind of all we need to know about Chip. He's a basic white boy. Chip's Oh, there you go. Keywords. Basic white boy, fatherless, and bastard. That sums up pretty well, not even gonna lie to you. We are also introduced to another key character. Pretzel. Pretzel is a frog puss. What is a frog puss? A mix between a frog and an octopus. Pretzel is Gil's companion. He was given her by his sister Eden down in the undersea, and he takes her with him. Before we move on, I forgot I'm gonna put up two important factors for Chip and Jay. Key character moments, if you will. So for Chip, we have the hole in the sea trauma. And for Jay, we have Ava dies, disappears. We don't quite know what happens to Ava. We just know that she is gone. We start this campaign in the town of Zero. Now, we learn pretty quick that Zero is a town that is pretty much run at the minute by the Navy. I'm not gonna lie to you, we open with arson, literal arson. The first event of this campaign is arson. Then we have about 10 minutes of bickering while Gil tries to figure out what a barrel is. The barrel is full of gunpowder, gunpowder, a light, arson. For that we have the first scene is literally arson. An iconic moment, if you ask me. Yeehaw! The crew adopt a little bird called Apple. Apple is a bluebird. Well, it's kind of revealed that these guys are kind of starting a bit of a revolution against the Navy in this town, whether they mean to or not. They are going against the will of the Navy, going towards the will of the people, really just headlining. And then we are also introduced to another hit character, 
Marshall John. Chip runs into, and I quite literally mean this when he's described as a burly chest. Marshall John is a member of the Navy, I believe an admiral of the Navy, or like a pretty high ranking officer. He is an absolute Chad. Okay, he is Jack Manifold Chad face. He is, he is, uh, he is the rock, Dwayne the Rock Johnson eyebrow raise. This man, this man is big. He is beefy. He is, he would be a gym bro. Chunk of hunk. He is 90% muscle and 10% hottie. Like, however, we do actually not have any canon character art of Marshall John. And so I did in fact get a generic picture of a biker. His keywords are going to be John in all caps with like four N's, tatted and kidnapper. There we go, John. Tack for tat. Tack for tack, tack, tack for tat. Fuck. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is tat for tat, tack for tack. Gillian runs into John and pretty much tries to convince him to leave the Navy and join their ship. So far, he does not succeed, does have a very nice conversation and does literally try to gaslight the Navy. Another cool, certified riptide moment. Gillian eats gunpowder and then instantly does a keg stand. Keg stand of the century. Don't mind if I do. Then pretty much they leave. They've done what they have to do. They've caused the chaos. They get on the ship. The ship is called the Big Chipper. We are told that this is pretty much chip ship. Then they literally immediately crash. They set sail on the ocean and then crash. How do they crash, you ask? Fucking sea lemurs. Gillian Tidestrider tries to feed a sea lemur gunpowder. That is not a joke. That is not a bit. That actually happens. This is the actual plot of this fucking campaign. They crash. Probably takes me longer to blue tack all of this shit than it actually does for me to explain the plot. They arrive at a undisclosed location at which we learn to be laughing lot. And they find a mysterious man who cannot stop laughing. And this is where we go into the second arc of Riptide, Laugh and Lot. The crew pull up at Laugh and Lot and they find a guy pretty much who cannot stop laughing. They walk through the town and they find that everyone cannot stop laughing. So they walk through this town, they eventually pull up at an inn and meet an old man. We learn that this old man, who also cannot stop laughing by the way, he's a good fat giggler. This is Old Man Earl. Now I cannot quite explain to you the beauty that is Old Man Earl. Old Man Earl is a gilf. That's the only way I can explain him. We learn that Old Man Earl owns an inn and is like a bartender at that inn. They go to the inn, everyone's fucking laughing. Are you seeing a theme here? Key point here. Earl. Icon. Legend. Slay Master 9000. And also, we have a character portrait of Earl. Old Man Earl's key descriptors are juice maker, resident sass maker, and I don't have a third one. Pretty much this is where it all starts. Here is where everything starts to go wrong. Here, Old Man Earl sends them on a fetch quest to go and find some oranges. Now, oranges and Gillian Tide Strider do not go well together. Gillian, Gillian Tide Strider goes out on this adventure to find some oranges. And what does he run into but three orange retailers? One of them with a tangerine, one of them with mandarins, and one of them with oranges. What does he do in this situation? He doesn't know what an orange is. He's been told that an orange is round an orange, but these three separate fruits in front of him all are round an orange. He doesn't know which one to purchase. And so he goes and he asks them some questions. We are introduced to a mandarin. Gillian learns that a mandarin here is a selfish orange seller, that her business is fraud and she is selfish. Gillian does not buy a mandarin's mandarins. He goes and buys the tangerines. Whether that was the right choice or not, he's not quite sure, but I do know that this creates the great orange debacle. Once we have the orange debacle, I can't quite describe what happens next. Gillian slaps tens of bald men. This is what we call the baldening. The baldening is an incredibly intense and emotional event in which the hair of all three Riptide Pirates is severely threatened. None of them end up going bald, thank fuck. But just know that there is an insane chance. Chip convinces Gillian to go in and slap bald men, saying that 
it is a nice tradition. And if you know this about the real fucking world, you do not slap bald men. That is not something that you should be doing. Gillian doesn't know that. He goes and slaps a bald man. The bald man. On the wall he goes. In this moment, a woman passes out from laughing too hard. This is kind of when the crew understand that, like, this is some sort of curse or something's happened to the town. People aren't just laughing for the sake of it. They are cursed with laughing and they can't control it. Being the good people that they are, they go and find the mayor of this town, whose name is Sir Roland Laughin. Mayor Roland Laughin explains that he has made a deal with a mysterious figure in the woods. A fantastic start, if you ask me. And as this is happening, the crew watch as he starts coughing up this black gunk. Now, I don't know if you remember black gunk from all the way back at the Black Rose, but the captain got gunk. This is the exact same black gunk we see happening to Mayor Roland Laughin. We have gunk volume one. You can pretty much assume, as do the crew, that... If this gunking continues to happen to the mayor, he will, in fact, die. So they go off into the woods to try and find this guy that Mayor Roland Laughin made a deal with. While in the forest, they find this angry little gnome called Julian. He's, like, wearing leather. They kind of team up for a little bit. It kind of sparks this discussion around whether the mayor is a good person, whether he did the right thing for this town, taking the deal. Then, suddenly, things stop. And... We are introduced to, I would argue, the most iconic character ever created in human history. We are introduced to Desire Daddy, Papa Possibility, the Wish Doctor, Niklaus Hendricks. We just need to take a moment to look at Niklaus Hendricks. There is uproar, there is applause, there is cheering. Nick is a mysterious figure. He kind of just pops up, pretty much spawns like a house just in the middle of this forest. And Gillian walks into said hut. We have Desire Daddy. Firstly, Gillian is like, yo, what the fuck did you do to the mayor? And Nick explains that he offered the mayor a deal. The town, I believe, was like falling under. There wasn't many like fruit or riches or anything like that. And he made a deal with Mayor Roland Laughlin in order, he said that in order to make the town thrive again, he would have to give up something that he loved. Nick sort of says that he did this, he made the deal, it's not his fault that he's getting gunked, it's the mayor's own fault for being selfish, that Niklaus offers Gillian a deal. That deal is he will reverse the effects of the deal with the mayor. This deal with the mayor, obviously he wanted the town to be happier. Everyone is now laughing and they're dying from laughter. He will undo that deal. He will save the town in order from a favor from Gillian. He says he doesn't know what this favor is. He doesn't know what this favor is going to be or when it will be. Gillian being Gillian says yes. And he gets this sick-ass tattoo on his wrist that's like a, a crescent moon with like an NK in it. Pretty much has just sold his life away to Niklaus Hendricks. First thing in the Gillian section, Nick's deal. The town is back to normal. We've solved the issue here. We've created a separate issue, but the first issue has been solved at least. There's a bit of time. Obviously their ship has crashed, so they have to try and build a new ship. The town offers to build a new ship for them for saving said town. In this little time that they have here, ship gets hitched. He gets drunk one night and he marries Amanda Wren and he wakes up the next morning and is incredibly shocked by his actions. It is vital. So Chip gets hitched, goes on the wall. Gillian claims that polyamory is punishable by death in the undersea. So now Chip is literally fucking wedlocked and technically for the rest of the campaign, Chip is still married to Amanda Wren. Oh fuck, hold on. Polyamory is punishable by death in the undersea. They get on the ship. New ship is called the Albatross. Chip thinks it's called the Millennium Chipper. They bicker about this. This bit does not get dropped for the entirety of the campaign. And they set sail. I forgot to mention, they convince Old Man Earl to come on the ship with them. Um, Old Man Earl joins the Albatross. He now sets sail with them and makes juices. Um, I have sticky taped the microphone to a hot pink gel pen um we move on now to the blue royale casino omg we are also introduced here to the icon rambu rambu is our first guest appearance on grwi he plays a dragonborn called clawton now this is clawton and my friends you may be thinking hmm rambu on just roll with it Rambu was a really big creator. Surely that was on trending. And I'm going to tell you that it was. People saw Rambu 
in a pink suit. And they were like, yeah, that is the shit. That is the shit. The pink suit's going on the wall. They find this casino that is sailing in the middle of the ocean. They pull up at this casino. We are introduced to Clawton here. Clawton is dragonborn. His three main words would be gambling addiction, pink suit, and too many briefcases. Clawton has a phrase. And that phrase is, if you don't win, double your bet. Now, you can imagine how this goes for good old Gillian Tide Strider, who, you know, doesn't really know much about gambling doesn't have a lot of money. Chip, by the way, fucking loves money. This man would definitely invest in a Bitcoin. Jay Farron is pretty impartial to it. Gillian Tidestrider likes to throw away his money like it's nothing else. This man has placed more bets than I ever have in my entire life. Clawton teaches Gillian that if you lose, just double your bet. And you can never guess what they do together. They start fucking gambling. And not only do they start gambling, Gillian finds a frog to puss races. There's one thing Gillian loves, it's a battle. You can guess what he fucking does. So, Frogtopus gambling. While Gillian and Clawton are Frogtopus gambling, by the way, of which Pretzel loses, while this is happening, we find that I believe Chip and Jay are handed this set of drinks by one of the bartenders, and they take a drink and now are compelled to stay. They cannot leave, they do not want to leave. It's pretty much implied here that Everyone else in this casino is also the same. Think Percy Jackson Underground Club, where it's like they drink and they've been there for like 15,000 years and only think they've been there for the night. That kind of thing. This has happened to Clawton and now it's happening to our girl bosses, Chip and Jay. They kind of eventually figure this out. So they kind of try and fight the bouncers because they realize that people here are under this big magical, you know, spell to stay in the casino and gambling is bad. In this fight, Chip does in fact take off his pants. Certified chip moment. Chip takes off his pants. This is the first of many pant related incidents, by the way. I like to imagine that he has little boxes on underneath that have his little face on them. Or Arlen's face, that's probably funnier. In the midst of this, they do in fact teach Gillian about pyramid schemes. Just something else to add to the list. They learn that this casino is being run by this character called Mr. Dice. They are taken up to this big roulette board that is like, you know, the size, so like you're, you as a person could run on it. And Mr. Dice explains, you know, his scheme of making money and how everyone in the casino is really happy and they just keep betting and this casino is insanely popular because they're fucking kidnapping people. And there is this big, I guess, roulette ball. I am gambled. I don't know how you play roulette. There's this big roulette ball basically coming towards them and they have to figure out what the hell to do. As this ball rolls towards them, they think that they're going to die. Pretty evidently, you know, big ball coming towards you. Bit gay if you ask me. Balls, am I right? <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad one. Balls, am I right? She especially thinks he's going to die. And in this moment, he admits to Gillian that he lied about the bald men. Chip admits that he's been messing with Gil, he's been lying to Gil. In the moment, it's nothing. Um, but we will be coming back to this, I can assure you. They end up winning against Mr. Dice. As they say goodbye to Clawton, Clawton hands them, I think, one of the best things ever created in a D&D &D game literally ever, a briefcase of holding. Clawton has an obscene amount of briefcases. A bag of holding pretty much is like Mary Poppins' endless bag. Just roll with it, have a theme of making bags of holding into literally anything but a bag of holding. So now we have a briefcase of holding, an infinite briefcase. They have an infinite briefcase. We are at episode 81 and they are still using the briefcase of holding. Rambu, thank you for that one. Um, icon, to be honest. Pink suit slay, pink suit serve, pink suit pussy poppin, uh, maraca realness. It's giving camp. It's giving looking camp right in the eye. And that's, that's Clawton's arc. Chip, Jane, Gillian. Go back to the ship. Next day, they wake up and Chip makes a few light jokes. And he's making these jokes and Gil isn't really taking to them. He's not really paying attention. You know, Chip says something and, and Gil just turns around and goes to, to his barrel, you know, which he sleeps in every night, his little barrel. There's a bit of something's going on. Gil challenges Chip to a duel. I have just put the entire episode on the wall. Episode 15, the chip on my shoulder. This episode is a win for gay people and sword enthusiasts alike. Gillian has made a goddamn ice arena saying that Chip lying and making fun of him is an insult to Gil's honor. He gives the most 
insane pussy popping, like serve slay realness, like fucking monologue ever. Charlie Slimesicle is a monologuing queen. Chip doesn't want to fight Gil, obviously. They're friends. But there's not really a choice here. These guys haven't been sailing together for very long. They're still pretty new to all this. This is fucking insane. This is the most homoerotic sword fight I have ever seen in my entire life. Jay pretty much comes up and puts them both in their place and says, yo, what the fuck are you doing? You're supposed to be friends. This isn't the way to solve this. Stop fighting. And they pretty much both huff off, go and sulk in a corner. Both Chip and Gil get a moment. The duel. TM. The next day, they kind of try to solve their issues a bit. And in order to do that, Gil and Jay have a nice little prank where they prank Chip and it's a really nice moment. There's a really nice conversation that Chip and Gil have. Chip pretty much apologizes. He apologizes to Gil for all this shit that he's done. He says the line, you and me, we're like fish and chips. I'm dead. I'm gone. I'm crucified. I'm destroyed. You and me, we're like fish and chips. They're best friends, your honor. They're best friends. It's going on the fucking wall. And as we close out the Casino Royale arc, we learn true horrifying news. That old man Earl makes orange juice with his feet. With the greatest pain in the world. I say the words, Earl's foot juice. Onto the Isle of Aya, or Desire Island, if you're feeling frisky enough. They've just discovered the eldritch horrors that is Earl making juice with his feet. What is it with this campaign and feet? Gillian Tyshrider is always chronically barefoot. Fucking old man Earl gets his dogs out to stomp on some oranges. Desire Island. Off in the distance, the pirates see a ship coming towards them. Who is on that ship if not for my absolute husband and Marshal John? Marshal John is back, baby. Gillian Tidestrider's gaslighting worked and he is here to live his life of piracy. Anyway, he pulls up. One of Marshall Jong's key words was kidnapper. Well, that is about to come back around because we find that he has actually stolen a child from Zero. Anyways, that's Ollie, or Oliver. Ollie is 12 years old. This is old Ollie. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Just imagine this, but 12 years old as Ollie. Chip gets attached to Ollie pretty goddamn quick. Chip kind of adopts Ollie in the same way that Arlen adopted Chip. Ollie's keywords are 12 years old, 12 years old, and 12 years old. Marshall John says that before the Navy, he used to actually have a pirate crew of his own, and he wants to try and get back to them. He says his captain was named Elizabeth, and he wants the, hel the help of the Riptide Pirates to try and get back to Elizabeth. And they're like, you know what? Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll do that. We'll, we'll help you out. I don't see why not. We have literal kidnapping that can go up on the wall. Basically, some sirens attack the ship and Chip and Jay are overtaken by the beautiful siren song and they both hop in the water and try and swim to shore. Humans cannot swim that far. They pass out in the water, are pretty much taken, dragged into a prison cell. Chip shaves all of his hair off. I think we seem to sit with that one for a little bit. Anyway, so Chip buzz cut truth here is going on the wall. He's now got a buzz cut, fucking dweeb. And then we introduced to Aslana and Maria. One of them's a mermaid, one of them's like a bird person. And they pretty much say that they are looking for the one. They're looking for this prophesized one who will help them save their island. And Gil, who is obviously champion of the undersea, hero of the deep, the one, is like, hold the fuck on. I'm the one. I have to fulfill my prophecy. I, that's it. I am the chosen one. I am your one. Take me to your fucking queen. And so they're like, oh my god, it's the one. Because Chip and Jay are vouching for him. And they're like, yeah, he's the one, obviously. And they introduce him to Empress Malice. Empress Malice is a hottie. Empress Malice is beautiful and gorgeous and has the voice of a thousand sons and is sexy and seductive and is my wife. She's mine, not yours. I don't know why you keep giving her the eye and winking at her and like why you in her DMs, but like she's mine. Like we've been together for like ages. I don't understand why. Pretty instantly, the first thing she asks is, do you think that I'm pretty? And Gil and Chip say no. And Jay says yes. And <laughs> as a punishment, Malice turns them into stone. Malice plays a little tune on her little keyboard and turns them to stone. Get stoned, lol. Get stoned. Not funny. Stoned. This is where we kind of learn a bit more about Malice. We are kind of told that she loves to sing, she loves music, she's got a beautiful voice. Is 
a little bit clinically insane, but we can look past that. You know, we've all been there. We've all we've all gotten a little bit kooky. It's okay. Gillian's like, hold on, I'm the one. Don't turn me to stone. And she unturns him to stone and then fills his briefcase with 500 square foot of water, as you do. Takes the water out of the briefcase, casts shape water, and makes ice instruments for everyone to play. And they all play a nice little tune for Empress Malice, which is nice, I guess. That's pretty cool. This then revealed that because of Malice, Everyone is stone. Gil claims to be the one. And so she is like, okay, fucking bet. Sends him on a fetch quest, pretty much. Fetch this item to, to tell if Gil is the one. Um, she sort of has this little vial of stuff and she gives part of it to Chip. So his top half is no longer stone, but his bottom half is stone. So they have to haul Chip around for a bit. Dungeon crawl kind of thing. They meet this creature. And they're about to kill it, and then they ask, does it have nice eyes? And of course it has kind eyes, so they can't kill it anymore. They fall upon a room. This room instantly casts a spell on Chip and Jay. And they both think that they are incredibly hot. They fall in love with themselves instantly. They think they are the top shit and start violently insulting each other as a repercussion. There's a mural on the back wall, and it pretty much says that you have to perform an act of love. And so they try, there's like a fake proposal thing, and then... Um, obviously Chip and Jay are like going fucking at it. They are losing their minds, they are turning feral, and eventually Jay falls into this like fountain where they've been looking at themselves in like the reflection. She falls into the fountain and is dragged down, and Jay is drowning at this point in time. Jay is drowning, and Gil starts to freak the fuck out, and he's like, oh, what do I do? I have to perform an act of love. And I quote, I kiss him on the mouth. <laughs> Vine boom everywhere. Catastrophic vine boom. Let me get this fucking straight to you guys. They both roll a natural fucking 20. Performance check. Right. Oh, to oh, show how, how genuine the kiss is. 20. We need to do this. Natural 20! No. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did you both roll a natural yes. 20? No. <laughs> what? You both got a Holy fuck! Both of these motherfuckers roll natural 20s for a kiss on the fucking lips. Now, how are you going to defeat the allegations? There's no way you fight that shit, okay? But on the wall for this, I am putting episode 21, an act of love. Pretty much this saves Jay. That breaks him out of their spell. They bring Jay out of the water. She's still drowning, whatever. They bring her out. They go to the next room. They find a black and gold compass with an NK written on the back. Now, if you are like me and are literally crazy, some red flags may be going off for you right now. Black and gold, NK. Don't know if you guys remember, but the egg that these three found on the black rose under the water in the hole in the sea had black and gold coloring. NK is the same tattoo that Gillian currently has on his arm because of Niklaus Hendricks. Open the compass. They get the information that this compass points to the thing you most desire. Remember this item, by the way, the compass TM. This item becomes emotionally devastating later. All right, okay, I can get behind this a little bit. Guys, I'm a fucking YouTuber. They find the compass, they reach the top of this hill, and at the top, what do they find? What do they find but a journal by Finn? Finn motherfucking Tide Strider. They open it and they try to read it and I am not even joking when the only thing that they find out about Finn Tyshrider is that he fucks. They bobsled down this big hill, they meet the Empress again, and what they see is that she starts to gunk up a little bit. The black gunk, guys. The black gunk is back. Gunk 2.0. Gunk 2 electric boogaloo. Gunk the second. And here we learn that Malice made a deal with good old Niklaus Hendrix. He's back. She wanted to be famous. She wanted to live through music. That's what her heart desired. And Niklaus used that greed and basically pretty much said, well not said, but what she got out of the deal was she could sing and everyone would love it, but whoever listened to her music would turn to stone. Basically, we learn that you need her blood to revive everyone. Except, put the dots together, entire town of stone, one person's worth of blood, you can't really get that much blood keeping them alive. You kinda have to kill Malice.
Q, big fight. They one-on-one -on -one malice and the entire time she's given this big speech about desire and fame and all of that kind of shit. And somewhere in here, there is a battle of the bands. There is a hit single made by Gillian and the Tide Striders. Hole in Your Heart by Gillian and the Tide Striders. Stream it on Spotify. They attack Malice, they end up winning. Okay, this is kind of slow. This is kind of iconic. It's a bit evil. It's a bit, dare I say it, malicious. But the... The Alpha Trio start to sing to Malice with her own instruments and start to turn her to stone. Now tell me that's not Slay. Tell me that is not the coolest shit you ever heard. And as she's turning to stone, she literally rips her heart out that is pumping blood and gives it to them so that they can go and put the heart in the water supply and save the entire town. Aslana and Maria give the three of them necklaces. With that, they set sail. That is the end of the Malice arc. The Desire Island arc, and dare I say it's pretty fucking insane. Joaldo. Remember the compass that we get uh, here? Well, Chip gives it to Ollie before they go. The 12 year old boy. You know, Oliver? The actual 12 year old? Yeah, Chip gives it to Ollie for safekeeping. The albatross gets attacked by these goblins. Chip doesn't want to kill them. Bit of a shock because, I mean, he's a bastard. He, son of a whore, and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgot. This does have i think one of my favorite lines in all of just roll with it that i quote literally all of the time but holy shit i think it's so funny one of the goblins walks up to gillian tide strider and says please i have a family and to which gillian responds so does everyone and then proceeds to violently murder him if that isn't the funniest shit i have ever heard then i don't know what is and then one of the goblins attacks ollie and Chip goes fucking feral. Chip kills this thing. You see the connection here? The parental Arlen James connection? Chip Jane Gillian, Marshall John, Ollie, and Old Man Earl pull up at Joeldo. The first thing they do is sign up for the Paramount Tournament to win a bunch of gold. This is where John thinks Elizabeth is. Now, they sign up for the Paramount Tournament and somewhere in here they are asked about the pirate code and here we learn that number one rule of the pirate code is do not piss your pants. And I live by that. They sign up under the name Chibo and Chums because Chip does not want to write his real name down and so he goes under it as Chibo. Chibo and Chums is going on the wall. They find a bar, they sit, they... Well, I'd say they sit, but actually no, what happens is Chip's serial pantsing spree. He decides that he wants to start violently pantsing everyone. Who is to stop a man from his desires? He pants so hard, he knocks these motherfuckers out. Wrecked quote from the fucking pantsing phenomenon is, Chip takes it back and he's not dead from pantsing, which implies that he could have died from pantsing. We visit Jay, who is up in her little bedroom, and we see a mysterious figure press a gun to the back of her head, asks what the Navy is doing here. What the hell is Navy doing here? Firstly, implying that she fucking knows Jay is Navy. Secondly, that she's been following them. Jay answers a few simple questions, not really giving anything away, and the mysterious figure leaves. And the next day, the Riptide Pirates, they enter the Paramount Tournament. The first game is a game of Capture the Flag. Who else is in this game? If it isn't Marshall John's old crew, Elizabeth and Caspian? Oh my god! Okay, I feel like I have to explain this one. There isn't any canon artwork of Caspian. Um, anyway, it's Caspian. <laughs> Caspian is a water genocide. He is like Gillian, but a lighter blue. Doesn't have fins and looks more like a person. Does have water magic, though. Main descriptors are waistcoat, fashion slay, another water bro, but not a fish, and oh my god, hello! And who is that? Lizzie, the captain of the Granbury Pirates. But hold on. Lizzie? I recognize something like that. Lizzie sounds an awful lot like Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Chip's adopted sister from the Black Rose. Boom, by <laughs> applause and cheer, farting for years. Elizabeth Lizzie Lafayette. Her keywords are you should probably talk to someone about the alcohol. Literally the most pirate pirate ever. 
and really wants to go to war. Is the flag being captured? Well, slowly. Firstly, Chip has to fucking process the fact that Lizzie is here, and Lizzie has to process the fact that fucking Chip is here. But wait, Lizzie kind of knew Chip was here because Lizzie pressed the gun into the back of Jay's head. You see, things are going a bit insane, they're going a bit kooky crazy right now. Anyway, we're, but we're still playing capture the flag. And who fucking captures the flag? That's right. That is fucking right. Fucking Pretzel. Pretzel takes the dub. Pretzel takes the dub and captures the flag for Chibo and Chums. Meaning that they win the first round of the Paramount Tournament. That they get to go on and try and defeat the Paramount Champion. Chip, Jay, and Gillian uh, meet up with... Lizzie, Caspian, and reunite. Sorry, I've been talking to the microphone. And reunite John with his crew, the Granberry Pirates. So they all have a bit of a big conversation, and it's like, oh my god, you're alive. How the fuck are you alive? And Lizzie he starts talking about a war against the Navy. She is very cautious about Jay because she knows Jay is Navy. And she is very suspicious of Jay because why the fuck is Navy with Chip? And this starts a bit of a, a feud between Lizzie and Chip because Chip doesn't want to go to war. Bada bing, bada boom. I don't want to go to war. This is pretty important because Chip's, again, his one goal is literally to find Arlen. That's all he wants. He doesn't want to get involved in Lizzie's war. He doesn't want to get involved in the Navy. He doesn't want to get involved in all that shit. He cares more about his life. Than he does about like the fate of the world. Gil and Caspian have some fish to fish bonding time. They get drunk, they have a few squirties. Chip, Gil, and Jay are approached by a figure. Pretty much says, Hey, I will pay you a fuck ton of money if you purposefully lose against a Paramount champion tomorrow in the tournament. And Chip is like, fuck yeah, I'll take it. And Gil is like, uh fuck no, we're gonna defeat this bitch. Chip then miraculously meets a suspicious figure in a back alley. This figure is a tabaxi, a cat, pretty much. He's a cat man. It's like the scat man, but less shit and more cat. Jesus fuck. La Alma. Enter Pokey. Not Pokimane, like Poke, like P-O-K-A-Y. Chip sees La Alma talking to the man who approached them earlier about the money and losing the fight called the Baron. It's no secret at this point that La Alma is the paramount champion they're about to fight the next day. Uh, La Alma's keywords, by the way, are cat, cool mask, and homoerotic check tension with Chip. Pretty much they have a fight with La Alma, who is a paramount champion. Chiba and Chump win! Huzzah! Paramount tournament on the wall. Because they won, however, they are then confronted by the Baron. The Baron is like, what the fuck, we have a deal, and then makes them sign the contract because apparently what happens is once you win the Paramount Tournament, you then have to come back every year to be the Paramount Champion to fight. La Alma has been stuck in this position for many, many years, and by winning, they have finally freed him. They steal something from the Baron. This item is the Luxpress Pearl. The Luxpress Pearl I can only describe as Forbidden Water Orb. The Forbidden Water Orb Pretty much, it's like a magic eight ball. You look into it and it, you ask it a question and it tells you, like, what's gonna happen. They take it to Caspian, tells Gil that this Luxpress Pearl belongs to one of the gods of the undersea. In order to get out of this, obviously, deal that they've signed, have a fight with the Baron, they win. La Alma then goes and reveals the truth about the Baron to the people, has a big-ass speech about, like, the corruption of the Baron. And also, during this time, uh, Jay is writing a letter. We don't quite know who to. She says her mum. We can kind of guess it's to the Navy. This is the first time we see Jay make, well, try to make any kind of contact with any of her family. It's going on the wall. Guess who rocks up? It's the fucking Navy. The Navy show up and they start attacking. Literally burn this city to the ground. They set it alight. There are buildings on fire. The people are running. They are trying to get as many people out of Joaldo as possible. The entire city catches fire. It's going on the wall. They just want to try and get out of there, but Lizzie convinces them to try and take as many injured and sick people aboard the Albatross as possible and to get them to the next kingdom over. Lizzie says she'll meet them there. She'll meet them at the Navy prison. They've At this point, they've agreed to go to war with her. They've agreed to try and take on the Navy at least at some point. They see in the distance, my baby girl, Marshal John, get captured by the Navy. It's at this point, it's pretty clear that the Jay does not send the letter to the Navy. She does not get a chance because the city is literally on fire. How we end this arc is... The Riptide Pirates and the Granberry Pirates sailing off, leaving this city of flame 
in the distance, not knowing if Marshall John is dead or if he's in prison, with these tens and tens of sick and dying people on their ship. Let's move on to the next arc, Edison Kingdom. I would like to once again please say a fantastic thank you and can we all cheer for Alistair, my dear, dear friend. Alistair's help everybody. I would not have been able to do this part of the video. Dig our little tootsies into this arc, shall we? You guys remember the compass, right? Remember how Chip gave it to Ollie for safekeeping? Turns out the keeping isn't so safe. Because when they get back to the boat, what do they see? Old Ollie. Turns out Ollie used the compass to try and find where his mother was. And violently and rapidly aged, this is a 12 year old who is now in the body of like a 16 or 17 year old. He went from pre-pubescent to fucking adult. This shit is traumatizing and horrible. Ollie becomes Oliver. The compass goes in the briefcase of holding, by the way. The compass goes in the briefcase of holding because we realize you cannot trust anyone with it, especially Chip and especially Ollie. So it's now in the briefcase in a pair of pants. We learn uh, that Pretzel is in fact a violent chess master and can beat literally anyone at chess. Pretzel the Frogtopus is a chess master? Iconic, legend, girl bossification of Pretzel. Remember that Luxpress Pearl that we found? The, you know, the pearl of literally the gods? Well, would you look at that? Who's here? It's Dugon, my boy. Dugon is a leviathan. His way out of the ocean. We meet a leviathan. This leviathan is literally a god of the undersea. Gillian Tytrider is from the undersea. He meets one of his fucking gods. You know how insane that is? You can imagine how insane Gillian goes for this because it's literally a god. My boy. I cannot explain to you how much of a Chad Dugon is. I don't think he said a single word, but my god, is he fucking Fergalicious. Fergalicious Dugon is going on the wall. <laughs> I'm so sorry for saying the words Fergalicious Dugon. Oh god, I am a real adult. Gillian, being Gillian, obviously tries to feed him the Luxpress Pearl, which he eats, by the way. He does in fact eat the Luxpress Pearl. So now that's gone, I welcome you guys to Edison Kingdom as written here. Um, at this point, Liz Lizzie and her ship also pulls up a bunch of sick people on their ship. They pretty much just deliver them to like the town. The Granberry Pirates and the Riptide Pirates all agree to like meet each other at the block, the um, Navy prison. It's here that Jay buys Gil some new armor. This is a pretty sick Poggers cool Gamer Boy moment. Um, the armor that Gil was currently wearing is armor that he was given by the elders in the undersea. Now, at this point in Gil's like path, he's kind of still very destiny ridden, do not get me wrong, but he's kind of started to separate himself a little bit from all of that. And so Jay buying him new armor not only increases his AC, but also it's just like a really nice symbol of like Gil becoming less undersea and more oversea. They take Ollie with them at this point, they take him off the ship, they take him with him on this adventure, you know, because he's a bit older, well, looks a bit older at least, they kind of just decided to sort of as, as, a, uh, as a sorry for making you a teenager, we're going to take you on this adventure. So they do that. Find a little paper boy named Isaac who is trying to sell papers. Um, Gillian kind of accidentally kidnaps him. Long story. Isaac kind of gives him the basics of what's going on in Edison Kingdom. He does explain that in Edison Kingdom there's like these different layers um, and they kind of reflect the different layers of poverty and wealth. This city is built into like districts as well. So the one above them is the Blossom District. So they sort of strike to start to move towards the Blossom District. They do a bit of wandering. Chip buys a cool bandana. And it's here that Gillian goes to the post office. Except what's happening at the post office. They find Betty. Betty who works in the post office. Here something terrible is revealed about Betty. It's revealed that Betty shits in the packages at the post office. What the fuck? Hashtag don't trust the post office. Well, they, okay, at this point, they have learned that there is a king up on the highest story of Edison Kingdom. And on the, in the Blossom District, they meet someone called Blossom Boss. The Blossom Boss gives them a job because they fucked up his casino a few arcs ago. Remember the Blue Rail Casino? That was his casino. But they fucked it up a little bit. So now they have to do something for him, and that something is kill the king. They agree, however, in repentance to this, the Blossom Boss cuts off Chip's pinky. 
Chip is now pinkyless. He's got a buzz cut and he's pinkyless. They go up to the Crown District, which is the district above the Blossom District. Um, they go up by train, cool gravity train, cool gravity fight ensues. In order to try and kill the king, um, they do this bit where Gillian pretends to be a king or a bit of royalty from the undersea and dresses up in this fancy ass armor and pretends that he cannot speak English because Gillian refuses to lie, right? So Gillian refuses to lie to these people. They're trying to break into the kingdom. They have to lie to do it. Gillian doesn't want to lie. So they just tell him to tell the truth in a different language and pretend he doesn't speak common. You'll never guess what he does. He does that exact thing. And so for the next like fucking two hours of footage, it's literally just <laughs> Gillian admitting that they are going to kill the king in a completely different language while Chip and Jay lie through their teeth to get to the king. For this, we get King Gillian. They get into the castle and they find the king and his handler. However, things go a bit array when they discover that the king isn't actually an adult. They discover that the king is actually a child. He doesn't know about the poverty and the poor kids in the orphanage uh, because his handler has just kept him in this room and like made him live in the kingdom, in the castle and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is also a pretty big plot twist. So the child king is also going to go on the wall. They pretty much managed to get out alive. They bring the king down to the bottom district and show him around, tell him about the poverty and all of the you know, lower class, and he's like, oh, I'm gonna help change. Oh my god, the Riptide Pirates have done a good thing for once in their fucking life. They have solved a problem here. Incredible kiss, 10 out of 10. Fantastic slay, serve, iconic, incredible. Lizzie has gone, set sail, since they've been up there for quite a while. She set sail, has agreed to meet them in the Navy prison. Meantime, while doing that, they managed to recruit a robot, a warforged, whose name is Alphonse. He is Texan. What more do you want, Tay? So also there is no canon artwork of Alphonse. If you're not getting the gist here from the characters we don't have any canon art of, I kind of take some creative liberties. It's Glamrock Freddy. It's so nice to meet you. Let's join the animatronic family. It's Alphonse. Alphonse joins the Riptide Pirates. They pretty much tell him that he has free will and can do whatever the fuck he wants. Blossom Boss, they kill the Blossom Boss. Then there's this really, really nice scene at the end here where all three of them are kind of just sitting down and they get to talking and Jay kind of talks a bit about the Navy and her family and they all just kind of have a really, really nice chat and it's here that they decide to be a pirate crew. This is honestly one of my favorite parts of Riptide. They decide that they are going to be called the Riptide Pirates. And instead of Chip being captain, they are all going to co-captain the Riptide Pirates. It is here that, that the Riptide Pirates swear to fuck shit up, to help those in need, and to be the best goddamn pirates that anyone has ever seen. The Oath of the Riptide Pirates. And with that, we end the Edison Kingdom art. This is the big boy stuff. We have Jura Week. Jura Week was revolutionary. Not just for JWI Twit, but for me personally. And this arguably is my favorite arc of the entire game. And so may I introduce to you The Block. I have never felt emotional turmoil as I have while watching The Block arc. That is saying something because I used to be a fanny. So we start The Block not at the block. Leave Edison Kingdom. They're going to try and save Marshal John. They need to get to the Navy prison, which is the block. They dock their ship accidentally on an island. And on that island, we are introduced to Jay Schlatt, or better known as Duke de Dukem, Duke of Duke. That is not a joke. That is his real actual name. How I take anything seriously on this show is honestly a mystery. But okay, so... <laughs> I feel like I have to explain myself every single time I have a character without official character art because I'm just pulling up the most insane photos ever but you have to understand I only have my imagination to go on and so Duke Du Dukem is literally just Jay Schlatt. It's big guy. He, Jay Schlatt. He was only there for one episode. Most guests are on for like two or three. Um, but he was just there for the one. Duke Du Dukem, Duke of Duke, is going on the board because honestly it's just a very funny name. 
And fuck you, I get to pick what I put on the wall because I'm making the video. So they go through um, this island, they discover that the Duke crash landed here. You know, he's lost his crew. Descriptors for Duke Dukem are big guy, Duke, and he just has pretzels. Like not, not pretzel, like he has pretzels, like the food. Duke is like, yo, it's my island, someone's taking over my island. And then they find a rock and a flower. They fall in love. I think they accidentally kill the flower. Chip turns into a flower. It's a whole thing. They find a lady who turns out is possessing all of the plants and the island is a living being and they kill the lady and now it's Duke's island. And that is that entire episode summed up to you in like 40 seconds. Now onto the juicy shit, okay? Now we're getting into... Now we're getting into the iconic moment. Can you hear the excitement in my voice? Can you hear me get giddy and excited? It gets fucking good. It gets fucking good, boys. Oh my god. Okay. All right. Okay. Heaven, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh my god. All right. So we pull up at the block. The block is like this Rubik's Cube sitting in the middle of the ocean. It's like a Navy prison. So it's like twisting and it's turning. They have to get in. But like, this is the infamous Navy prison where like no one can get in or out. And so what do they do? They disguise themselves. This is where Grandma J happens. I wish I had art of Grandma J. Every good girl boss should be a grandma at least once. So with the power of Grandma J on their side, they break in to the block. Grandma J on the wall. They go through a few rooms. Um, basically how this prison works is like everything is moving all of the time. So as you walk through, you pick a direction to go and there's a room and then you get out of the room and there's another direction to go and there's another room. It's like a bunch of rooms, but they're all moving. So you never quite know what room you're gonna get to or how you're gonna get there. So they find another creature. The kind eyes question gets asked once again. Then they get to the freezing cold room. I am picturing this room as Mr. Freeze Lego Batman level. They're type pirates. They see a hand sticking out of the freezing cold ice and they go to pick it up. And who is that? That's fucking Marshall John. Marshall John, he's fine, he's here, he is okay. Marshall John is in the prison. Marshall John is back. He is, however, completely frozen solid. He is an ice cube, he is an icicle. They find Marshall John, which is but they don't know if he's actually alive yet because as previously stated, he is a popsicle. He may be hot, but only in my heart. They pick him up and they haul him out of the room. Then they find the flesh room. Now, before I talk about the flesh room, I'm going to put the flesh room on the wall. The flesh room. The flesh room is probably the second most insane thing to happen on Just Roll with it at the time. Okay, so they enter the flesh room. And these tiny mouths appear on their body, of all of them. And at first, these mouths, in the voice of whoever they're on, speak like mean things about each, each other. Uh, there was a, a mouth on Gil, and Gil, in Gil's voice, the mouth told Chip that like Arlen was dead and he had to stop living for himself, you know, and stuff like that. And that was damaging enough. That was fucking damaging enough. Chip said to Gil that like he didn't think his destiny was real, you know, that's. You don't say that to Gillian Tidestrider. Then mouths appear again in this flesh room. And these mouths make you sprout your biggest secret. Do you see where I'm going here? Do you see why this is iconic? Do you understand? Mouth appears on Chip Bastard. And he says that he never has a plan. We knew this, but like, it's still pretty big. Here's the fucking kicker. Mouth appears on Gillian Tidestrider. The only thing we currently know about Gillian is that he has a destiny and he is champion of the undersea. We do not know why he is here. We do not know what he is doing. Gillian Tidestrider admits that he was banished from the undersea because he attacked a Navy officer. Vine boom, vine boom, vine boom, going on the wall, banished from the undersea. Next room they go to. They have to fight each other. It is a burning hot desert and Ch Agil sees her, his sister off in the distance, he sees Eden, he goes to run to hug her, turns out it's Jay. Chip sees Jay and Gil like stabbing him, turns out he's just stabbing himself. But in this room, Marshall John dethors, which is the only good thing that fucking happens. We get John, Gillian, John, Gillian. 
Marshall John is back, baby. He is back. Fuck yeah. They find another room. This room? It's dark. It's spooky. It's creepy. They walk through the room. There's a single skylight coming down, shining on a man hunched over in the middle. This man looks up, looks directly at Chip, and he says, What a string of fate, little buddy. <sighs> this man is Dre Ferrin. <laughs> this man is Dre Ferrin, and he's been locked in this goddamn prison for who knows how long, and his arms don't work anymore, and he's old and he's grey and he's disabled. Holy fuck, it's Dre Ferrin. Dre Ferrin, Dre Ferrin appears. This is going for Chip. Like, this is the first thing that he's got that Arlen may be alive. This is like a severe and reoccurring lapse in judgment for Chip Jirui. Like, genuinely. Holy shit. And we're at that point again where Just Draw With It gets so insane that I just have to put up the name of an entire episode. Episode 53. Not fair and well. I have never sobbed like this in my life. Hello, this is editing read. Just popping in, I realised I forgot to say that a mysterious figure appears at the door behind them, but a mysterious figure does in fact appear at the door behind them. And this mysterious figure, and who is it? Jason fucking Ferrin. Jason fucking Ferrin? Jay Ferrin's dad. Jay Ferrin's dad, Admiral of the Navy. I don't have any canon art. But I do have the fiery dad from My Hero Academia. It's pretty accurate, I'm not gonna lie to you. Descriptions for Jason Ferrin. I hate him with all of my goddamn heart. The most terrifying man in human history. Admiral of the Navy and world shitter's dad. And that's saying something because we have Chip, okay? Jason Ferrin comes in. He's like, Jay, what the fuck? And Jay's like, ah, oh, shit. And then Chip and Gil are like, oh, shit, that's your dad. Jason is like, Jay, what have you been doing? Messing with pirates, come back home. And she's like, no, these are my friends. And then he's like, come back home or I kill them. Chip and Gil are like, hey Jay, how do we fight your dad? We can't kill him, he's like really fucking powerful. And, and Jay is like, we don't. Leave, go, leave me here, let me go. Gil is like, no, I'm not fucking doing that. And Jay is like, you promised me. Context, when Jay bought Gil the armor back in Edison Kingdom, he was like, well, I owe you. And she's like, yeah, you, you know, you owe me a favor. It's like, okay, cool. She's like, now you owe me a favor. And Gil's like, no, I fucking no. And he takes off his armor. He takes off the armor that Jay Ferrin has bought him. Jay's dad casts command on Jay and says, discipline them, Jay. Discipline. And she takes her bow and arrow and she fucking aims that shit at Goddamn Gillian ties try to champion of the Odyssey Hero of the Deep and she shoots. Gillian goes down. Gilly gone. Gillian dies. And you know what this motherfucker slime school says? You know what he fucking says? He says Gillian goes down with a smile. Chip looks at looks at Jay with fucking disgust in his eyes. With disgust. Jay looks at Chip and she says, You wanna know my secret so bad, Chip? My secret is that I was using you from the beginning what i was trying to get closer to whoever killed my sister i convinced the navy to let me go undercover i was using you from the beginning it meant nothing to me <laughs> doesn't surprise you guys that that is going on the wall. Dre Ferrin has this mystical magical eye power, right? Then there's this big cool ass eagle, flame eagle out, knocks Jason back, giving them a head start. Chip medicine checks Gil, brings him back to life, kind of pod kind of champ. Jason had like this funky little ring that kind of tells you how the block works because you can't really escape because everything's fucking moving. So they take it and they run. And Jason gives them a head start, kind of because Jay is obviously his daughter, um, but he did make it very clear that she is now pretty dead to him. I'm going golem mode. Bruh. They pull up outside. They get back on their ship. Marshal John and Dre in tow. And they set sail. Jay Farron stands up and looks out to the sea. And she says, My name is Jay Farron, navigator of the Riptide Pirates. It's going on the wall. This closes out the block and Drew Wee Week.
It only goes up from here, boys, trust me. We are at Orport. Voila. After the absolute clusterfuck that we just went through, that was the block, you would have thought they deserve a little bit of a break. And said break is given by the one and only D&D legend, Joe Cat. He plays a character called Captain Tastrius. This is Captain Tastrius. Captain Tastrius rocks up. He is like a pirate ghost and explains to the crew that he needs help. He basically lives forever because he was cursed and like times have changed and he's not the same pirate he used to be but he wants to try and be laid to rest and in order to do that he needs the hand of the Riptide Pirates. They have to go under the water to try and find a magical item that his helms person left who's also a ghost. A bit more of an evil ghost though. They take a trip, a quick trip to the undersea but not like Gillian's undersea, a different part of the undersea. These two motherfuckers cannot breathe underwater. Gillian can. How do we get around this issue, you may ask? And to that I pose you Old Man Earl's foot juice. Old Man Earl once again pulls through, however does commit abuse first, and by committing abuse I mean that he literally rips part of Gil's coral off of his head in order to put it in juice so that Chip and Jay can breathe underwater. Kinda pog, kinda champ. We meet some pretty quirky characters, we meet this owl who we think is loosely tied to Nicklaus, but hasn't actually come up yet. Don't really know what she's doing, but just know there's a cool owl under the water. The four of them have to sing a sea shanty for some skeletons who also live there. This is like a shipwreck graveyard, by the way, so it's a bit kind of, bit, bit edgy, bit cool. And they find the helms person, they defeat said helms person, and gain a cool magical item. Uh, it's just a stick, they get a stick. And with that, Captain Tastrius head goes on his way. He parts, he drowns into the water, and we assume he'll live the rest of his ghost life very happily. However, now we are back on the boat. We have a Dre Ferrin to try and talk to. Chip is pretty desperate to speak to Dre. And so so he does. He goes, goes to Dre and he's like, hi, and Dre is like, holy fuck, mate, it's been a while. And Chip's like, yeah, how did you survive? He explains that he was woken up on a random island one day and was helped out by this mysterious figure. That's kind of it. That's kind of all we get. Dre is like, well, I mean, if I'm alive, then the other two have to be alive. This gives Chip so much hope that he probably shouldn't have. It's at this point that Chip tries to like give the albatross and like the crew to Dre. He's like, yeah, we'll get the other ones back and then you guys can be the captain. Anyway, Dre shows Chip a map that he has like on his back. It's like a magical tattoo thing and it's got coordinates down it. It's pretty fucking sick. And he says, well, I have this map on my back. So Finn must have the other map on his back. And they're like, okay, great. So we have to go and find Finn, right? Remember how I mentioned Niklaus? Well, he is back, baby. Who cheered, who whooped. Niklaus Hendricks is back for realsies. He visits Chip in his nightmares and he says to chip do you want to make a deal and chip is like fuck no uh niklaus is like what about ray and chip is like what do you mean and then niklaus is like well if dre's alive then finn must be alive and arlen must be alive and then chip is like where the fuck is arlen and and niklaus is like well He's in a place with a lot of pain and it's very dark. I can't get him back for you. And then Chip is like, well, I'll make a deal with you if you can get, you know, Arlen back for me. And Niklaus is like, well, I cannot do that. But I will say that you need to find Finn and put the coordinates together on his back. Niklaus is like, well, what do you want? And Chip is like, I want Ollie to go back to normal. Remember how Ollie is currently in an adult's body? Well, Chip is like, I want Ollie to go back to normal. Well, okay but then you owe me something. And then she was like, what a favor? And Niklas is like, no, you will not intervene with Gil's favor. What the fuck? Chip being the actual idiot and bastard and little piece of shit that he is says yes. Ollie is back to normal. He is a kid again. And Ollie's honestly pretty upset about this. You know, he had this life as, you know, being part of the crew and being big. And now he's gotten taken away from him again without his consent. I will however put Niklaus appearance numero duos. Nick's deal also gets put on the wall under chip. 
Chip has a bit of a chat with Ollie about going home. Because in the end, they did actually kidnap this child. And he does have a parent at home. It was like, hey, how's about we try and find a way to get you home? And Ollie's like, I don't want to go home. Ollie is like, one more adventure. And Chip fucking agrees. At least Ollie is going home. That at least is a dub. So, the bitches pull up to Allport. Now, Allport is a place that we have been hyping up for quite some time. This is a big moment. We want to get to Allport. Allport is kind of the centre of mana. It is like the big... It's like the capital, pretty much. It's got like entrances out to all four seas. They've also agreed to meet the Grand Berry Pirates here. They look over and they see the Grand Berry Pirates and their ship has been... I sawed this boat in half, okay? They are half of a ship. That is why they didn't show up to the block. Because their ship had been fucking sawed in half by Jason Ferrin. What did they see but Caspian, the absolute swagalicious hottie that he is, shaping water for four days to assure that this half of the boat does not sink. If that ain't fucking dedication to your craft, if that ain't a loyal man, then what is? Then what is? That is husband material. That is male wife material. Lizzie rocks up, obviously at the boat, and is like, hey, why don't we have a bit family bonding time. Chip and Jay, you come with me, and Gil, you go with Caspian. And she takes Chip and Jay onto Allport to a shop called the Divine Barkinist, is owned by Rufus. Now you guys probably don't remember Rufus from the beginning of this video, but Rufus was a member of the Black Rose. Rufus is a dog man. Wife's name is Amber and they own like a magical shop and they tinker together. Chip is like, holy fuck, it's Rufus from the Black Rose. And Rufus is like, oh my god, Chip. Chip looks around and buys the belt of mountain strength for Ollie. Now Ollie is super, super strong. But remember Apple the bird from Zero? Remember Apple the bird? Well, Apple the bird is with them and has been with them for quite some time. Um, Rufus looks over at Apple and says that Apple is not a bird. Apple is not a bird. He pretty much says that Apple never used to be a bird and that some transmutation magic has been used on her and that possibly Apple is a person that has been turned into a bird and that they have been taking with them for months at this point. We cut over to Gillian Slaystrider who is with Caspian and have dived into the water and having a nice little swim and they rock up at a... Bar, who was there behind the bar? Eden fucking Tide Strider. Eden, my beloved. Eden. Eden Tide Strider is Gil's older sister. They have been separated for quite some time now. Her keywords are tender, sussy, and also a fish. At this point, Eden kind of explains a bit that she found out that Gillian disappeared, wasn't told what had happened, and did some investigation into the Elders of the Undersea. And now is up here doing some more investigation. She kind of implies that whatever she wants to talk about is pretty important and that she can't talk here. So they agree to meet up later on after her shift with the rest of the Granberry Pirates and Chip and Jay later to have a conversation in a bit of a safer location. Then we jump back to the Beloveds. And Lizzie asked Jay to go on a walk. She asked Jay why the fuck she's here. She asked Jay if she's a Navy spy. And Jay just straight up says yes. She's just like, yeah, I was a Navy spy. I'm a Whiptide pirate now, I'm not with the Navy. They find um, a bar and get drunk together. It's, it's a certified pistol whip moment. Chip kind of pulls up a little bit later. Then Gillian and Eden and Caspian all rock up as well. And they all sit down and have a bit of a conversation. Gillian introduces Eden to everyone. Um, Chip is down bad literally instantly. So it's a running gag that Chip does not get bitches, okay? And this is a bitch that Chip definitely will not be getting, but oh my god does he want. He is down astronomically. He is down carnally, dare I say it. At this point, you know, Eden kind of brings up the, the elders again. And if you know anything about me, it's that Gillian Tyshrider is my baby boy. Is that quite simply everything he says gets absorbed into my brain and becomes my personality. 
There's a reason I have a blue hair and his fucking sword tattooed on my arm. It's here we're talking about the elders that for the first time he expresses doubt. He he expresses doubt in the prophecy. He expresses doubt in the elders and the undersea. And this is fucking massive. This is huge. This is He says, I realize they raised me to be a weapon. I it's it's, it's at this point in Riptide that I start to break down. It's at this point that Eden brings up the existence of Raft. Raft is an a sort of subgenre of the Navy. They have a Raft headquarters up the top of Allport. Allport is technically neutral ground, but the Navy are there. And the Navy have a lot of control, even though they shouldn't. Eden brings up the fact that she now knows that the Navy, or Raft, are trying to build a mechanical sea leviathan. You guys remember Dugon? Dugon is a sea leviathan. We already know that the undersea and the oversea aren't really on the best terms, especially with the Navy. Bad news that the Navy are trying to build a literal mech god of the undersea. So Sea Leviathan is going on the board. Eden says, hey, can you guys go and try and find the plans for this please up at Raft HQ? And they're like, fuck yeah, I'm gonna go do that. They've asked Amber to try and see if they could teleport Ollie home. We learn that yes, you can teleport Ollie to home, but you could not teleport back. So you'd have to teleport Ollie by himself and Chip doesn't want to do that because he promised Ollie that he would go and see his mum, which is pretty cute to be fair. So once again, we are one step further away from getting Ollie home. We find old man Earl stabbed in an alleyway, to put it lightly. So they fight whoever stabbed him in the alleyway and we learn that this person who did said stabbing was hired by this person named Captain Price. Chip Bastard recognises this name. He recognises the name Captain Price. And so as Gil and Jay go back to the ship, he goes off to a place called Darkport, which is just like all port but the evil section, to meet Captain Price. Now I'm going to put Price on the board and I'm also going to put paying the price on the board. We learn that Captain Price or Reuben Price, as he used to be known, was a part of Chip's old crew. In the years between the Black Rose and the Riptide Pirates, Chip was a part of a different pirate crew led by Reuben Price. They ended on some pretty rough terms and are now the, like, the equivalent of mortal enemies, pretty much. So he goes down to see Reuben and he's like, Reuben, what the fuck are you doing here? And Reuben is like, I need you to do something for me. There's this magical eye in the Divine Barkinist. Can you get it for me? Chip says yes, goes up to the Divine Barkinist. It's like, hey, Rufus, I need this eye for a bad guy. Can we make it a bad eye? Rufus is like, let me get my wife. His wife says, fuck yeah. What they do is they make an eye that as soon as Reuben Price puts it in, because he has one missing eye, he pops it in. He gets fucking paralyzed. They paralyze him. Like this, he is alive and well, but they like fully like for the rest of his life, they paralyze him. Anyway, get, gets back to the boat. That's all done, whatever. They go up to Raft HQ. A lot of shit happens here. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. They somehow fuck it up from the very beginning. So remember Eden was like, please be stealthy. And one thing they did was actually not be stealthy. At this point, they kind of all end up splitting up a little bit. Gillian hears something from downstairs and goes to find a room with a bunch of conch shells. In this world, conch shells are like telephones and you can like speak to people through them. And a bunch of Navy soldiers speaking about a transfer for a chosen one. It is here that I put up the part for chosen one two. But this implies here that there is a second chosen one because Gillian isn't getting transferred. I've got one of these for Gillian because this is a pretty important moment. Partially because it means that the elders may have lied to him, but also because it means that maybe there's someone else like Gillian out there who understands. Chip breaks off and finds a room, um, a vice admiral's room, by the way, and finds a tabaxi Vice Admiral. I believe his name is Kuka Kentu, something like that. 
and he rolls like a 30 stealth check. He is like incredible. He is the stealthiest bitch on the planet. Until he decides he wants to touch the person's hand. The big evil bear. The big evil cat. He's like, I want to touch it. It looks fucking fluffy. The fuck? Spoiler alert. It doesn't end well. He gets violently scratched across the chest and is given literal nightmares, which is the entire course of the next arc, because Chip made this one fucking dumbass choice to touch the fluffy evil person's hand. They continue. Slug, slug J happens. Not getting into that. Just no slug J happens. They get the plans. They get the plans and they give them to Eden. However, as they go back to their ship and they're about to leave Allport, Old Man Earl hypes up. Old Man Earl, having been minutes away from death the day prior, says that he is leaving the Riptide Pirates. That Old Man Earl has decided to retire. Earl's retirement. And with that, we end the Allport arc. Now we are getting into the final stretch of what is currently published of Riptide. We are at the Noctis arc. This is the second last arc of Just Roll With It Riptide. Going on the board is Noctis. We leave Allport. Now one member down. Old Man Earl has parted ways with the Riptide pirates. But we still have Ollie, who is now a child again, but is very strong. We still have Alphonse, the robot. And we obviously still have Pretzel. And I believe that's it. Oh no, and Dre. How can I forget Dre? We have Dre too. The first thing that they ask, well, they, Chip and Jay, just straight up ask Gillian about the prophecy. They ask Gil what his prophecy is. We have actually spent 70 episodes building up to this. And it's finally here. The prophecy. The prophecy. This one is also going up under Gillian. This is pretty damn important. Gillian's prophecy is as follows. Born of moonlight, storm and sea, he will rise and fall to bring unity. Tested and bested by evil's hand, one will remain sea or land. Chip gets a little bit pissy about this because it does imply that Gillian's destiny is to literally either drown the world or drain the sea. Comes to nightfall and we start to uncover Chip's nightmares. Chip is now having really, really intense nightmares almost every, well, literally every night. OMG. The nightmares. He refuses to go to sleep because of them. He is having nightmares about drowning, about being like, you know, engulfed in flame. This shit is like wrecking him. He is going insane. He's losing sleep. He's getting points of exhaustion. These guys pull up to Noctis. At this point, Chip hasn't slept for a good few days. So he's kind of losing his mind a little bit. They rock up, they enter a forest. The forest is completely dark. They cannot see. Um, Gil has a light up sword like a glow stick. He lights up his sword like a glow stick and they walk into the forest. They wander off of the path and once Gil's sword goes out, they are confronted by a very large beast. They kill the beast. They eventually reach the town and they run into Griffin. Griffin we are introduced to as a bounty hunter. He is a big panda man. But you guessed it, we do not have any canon character art of Griffin, boys. So I have taken the creative liberties to make my own. Um, <laughs> however, this is, you won't really understand it until I explain it. But to, in order to explain it, we have to get a little bit further down the path. <laughs> so for Griffin, I have this printed out picture of a chair with the word sleigh on it. <laughs> Griffin's keywords are beefcake, panda, and doesn't take the albatross's shit. Griffin JRWI, boys. We're introduced to Griffin, who kind of offers to be their tour guide a little bit, and explains so that these guys are at Noctis to try and get rid of Chip's nightmares. They need to find a person called Grim, who Amber pointed them to. Every year, Grim hosts a murder mystery ball. 
But to get into the murder mystery ball, they need invites. In order to get invitations, what do they do? They do a fucking fashion show. They go to a bar, they meet Rhea. Rhea explains a few ways you can get these invitations. One of them is they go to a haunted hotel or haunted mansion kind of thing, and they get one there. Chip has another nightmare in there. Shit is crazy. Another one is they can do this fashion show. Kind of because they need clothes for the murder mystery party. Obviously it has a dress code, but also because they can get an invite. So they go and they, they dress up. They try on some clothes. And this is when I get to explain Chair Griffin to you. Chair Griffin. Obviously they go and they get dressed. Chip comes out in, I believe it's like a polka dot clown suit. Slay the day away. Gillian comes out as Killian. As in he's an emo. As in he has black hair. He has a leather studded jacket. He has like black skinny jeans. He has boots on. He has a shirt that says the word kill on it. He's an, he's an emo icon. Gerard Way Slay who? Griffin comes out in a chair suit. Chair Griffin. Chair Griffin. He sits down near the chair and he stands up and he's a griffin. And then Jay comes out in the most gorgeous of dresses, like the girl boss that she is, get the invites for the party. They enter the ball. Pretty instantly, Jay gets the hots for a vampire. She does in fact admit her flaws and her flaws are that she was kind of into the vampire. Then Griffin announces the murder mystery. Turns out it's like a real life murder mystery game of like mafia, except people who die do in fact actually die. And I have never seen three people play Mafia worse than I have here. Holy shit, this takes so long and they, they barely discover who it is. Grimm's ball does go on the wall. They find out who the murderer is and Grimm appears. Now Grimm is pretty much Grimm from Hollow Knight. He exposits a bit about his backstory and why he's doing what he's doing and how he wants to be killed. Um, but he does also say that once you kill him, you get the equivalent of like one wish, right? So it's pretty easy. They do what they do best and they kill Griffin, obviously. Except in this moment, this is I think one of the biggest bits of character development we have seen from Chip, J.R.W.I. Bastard so far, is that he, uh, he's killed Griffin, he gets his one wish. He has the full chance right now to get rid of his nightmares. He has the chance to sleep tomorrow night nightmare free and, you know, get rid of the thing that is literally haunting him. Rather than that, he chooses to revive every single person that has been killed tonight in that murder mystery ball. He owns my heart. Chooses to revive everyone. One of the top 10 chip moments, if I don't say so myself. And with that, they decide to leave Noctis, having solved literally nothing and not solved any of the problems they came here to solve. But they do convince Griffin to join the Riptide Pirates and take the Pirate Oath, even though he's a bounty hunter and definitely doesn't want to be there. And so now Earl Spot has been replaced with Chair Griffin. All right, boys, this is it. We've arrived at the final current arc of Just Roll With It Riptide. Let's get into it, I guess. We have now left Noctis. And now we start, I've kind of combined two arcs together because it's kind of like an arc in an arc. Enter the Liquidus slash Feywild arc. We are pretty quickly introduced to our next guest, Jonah Scott. Like professional voice actor, Jonah Scott. So Jonah Scott plays the wonderfully hot and sexy Ichabod. Now Ichabod kind of just rocks up he kind of just shows up. He canonically doesn't have a shirt on. Ichabod. Ichabod kind of just rocks up and he pretty much just explains that he is trying to get to the city of Liquidus for some big political meeting. Ichabod tells Chip that there is a pretty big possibility that someone at Liquidus can help him with his nightmares. Because remember, we still haven't solved the issue. They find this big cool pirate ship. Turns out the entire pirate ship is like a mimic. At one point, Ichabod takes Jay aside because Ichabod also has a gun, right? Jay Farron has a gun, which is honestly one of the best things that's ever happened in this goddamn show. Ichabod takes Jay aside, gives her some black sand, 
aka some gunpowder. And he explains to her um, that he is trying to go to space. I need you to take that one in for a minute. That in this world, in this world of manner, where guns exist, and so does magic, but technology isn't that far advanced, you know. It's it's D and D that there is the possibility of space travel. This is the most absurd thing in genuinely this entire campaign. It's going on the wall. There's fucking space question mark. There's space. Anyway, after the big reveal that is space, um, the Riptide Pirates and Ichabod pull up at Liquidus. Liquidus is a hydropolis. It's a water city. It's not under the water like the undersea is, but it is water based. So they pull up at Liquidus. They part ways with Ichabod. And who arrives? Felipe. Felipe the tour guide. Now, the photo I'm about to show you of Felipe, I am pained to say, is literally canon art. This is the only art of Felipe we canonically have. And I am so sorry about what I am about to show you. We meet Felipe. They're fucking evil for this one. And he offers to give them a tour around, around uh, Liquidus. And the pirates say yes, because why not? They need a tour around Liquidus. And he takes them to the Moon Temple. Now, at this moon temple, we see a few things. We see a mural in the wall, and this mural tells the story of a specific chosen one of moonlight, storm, and sea. The information we kind of get here from the mural, at least, is that there is a chosen one of the moon, and that chosen one is chosen to keep the balance or keep the peace or pick the superior, I guess, between the moon goddess and the sun goddess. That's pretty big information, because before this, we didn't know anything about the prophecy. We did not know what Gil's destiny was. Now, at least we have some ground as to the higher power that have given Gil this path to go on. So we learn that Gillian is the prophesized of the moon goddess. They go and see this moon goddess, because that's just something you can do. So they go and see the moon goddess, and they're like, hey, um, I'm a uh, nightmares? And she's like, I got you, boo. Chip undergoes this trial in a sense where he kind of has to face the like nightmare demon. And basically through that, he is able to get rid of this poison in his body. Finally, Chip is nightmare free. Finally, we solve the goddamn issue. And it only gets downhill from here, boys. The Moon Temple. We now know the Moon Temple exists. And through this, we are also told the existence of a Sun Temple. What we found out is basically up a big tube to the sky. I will have to say also, this technically isn't the first time we've seen the Sun Temple. There was one that I think popped up in Allport, but just no one went there. They then decide they want to go break some animals out of the zoo. They break 17 animals out of the zoo and then are like, hey, we want to go up the big tube into the sky. And Gil's like, yeah, okay, cool. We'll go up to the big tube in the sky. Hold on a second though. I want to go and talk to the moon goddess. And so he does. He goes and has a chat to the moon goddess and pretty much just says, hey, am I the chosen one? And she says that, yeah, he is the chosen one. She says he has like that spark in him or whatever. So that at least quells that fear. They decide to go up into the big tube in the sky. They leave Ollie, Alphonse and Griffin here at the bottom because their ship is actually completely crashed. I did forget to mention that. It is destroyed. They leave them here and kind of give them the task of making a lemonade stand empire. More on that one later. They find the sun temple. Now this sun temple we see has the same mural as the moon temple. This sun mural has pretty much the same story as the moon temple but just says that there's a chosen one of the sun and so now there's the question of like is there two chosen ones a sun chosen one and a moon chosen one or is it just the one chosen one and it's just gillian and so here we have sun and moon chosen ones omg we also here in order to enter the sun temple are told that 
every Riptide pirate has to confess their sins. They all go into this like confessional booth. Uh, Jay goes in there first and she pretty much just confesses her guilt for losing her sister and how she thinks it's kind of her fault. Chip then goes in the confessional booth and he talks about how he is worried he's not on the right path. And then Gil comes in the confessional booth and admits that he doesn't want to be the chosen one. We get into the Sun Temple and we meet the Sun God, Asta. Hello, editing Reed here yet again. I think earlier I said that Gillian and the crew go and meet the Moon Goddess. They do not go and meet the moon goddess, they go and meet the moon priestess. They do not meet an actual god, um, and I made the same mistake here. So Asta is in fact the sun goddess, but they do not go and meet Asta, they go and meet the sun priestess. They have a quick chat with her, um, I don't really think anything super important comes up, she kind of just drops more lore information about the prophecy and the chosen one, and the... Um, relationship between the moon god and the sun god and with that they leave the sun temple and they go and stand outside and as they stand outside they look up on this roof and they see these rifts all across the sky opening up and literally without a second thought they fucking jump into the rifts now have we not learnt a single thing guys about just recklessness about doing things just because you can do them maybe we should have like two or three seconds of thought I think could be a good idea, maybe? Because, like, all of this wouldn't have happened. We could have had a nice, simple story. The Feywild is insane. And as we go to the Feywild, into the Feywild, we start Dewey Week 2. As we enter the Feywild here, Dewey Week 2, we start to use some stuff from the D&D source book, um, The Wild Beyond the Witch Line. So there is some spoilers for that in there. However, I will say, I have played a lot of Wild Beyond the Witchlight, and the spoilers are very light, they're very early game, and they take a lot of different choices than what is actually in the, the module, so you're pretty safe going. Just will chuck the spoiler warning out there. A lot of shit happens. They enter something called Cass's Carnival. Cass's Carnival is this traveling carnival in the Feywild that pretty much just tries to bring like joy to everyone. If its inhabitants, in this case, the Riptide Pirates, do something bad, the mood of the carnival decreases. And if they do something good, the mood of the carnival increases. So they must do tons of good things to make the carnival very cool and very happy, I say, knowing full well that they do nothing but cause havoc. They do a few little tidbits, okay? And then they go to the Hall of Illusions. The Hall of Illusions is pretty much like a fun mirror, like a fun mirror hall, right? And as you walk, as you walk down it, you get to see yourself in the past or the future, depending on how far you walk down the mirrors. It's all well and good until they see a man in this mirror maze. And they see this man as he looks in the mirror and is taken by a girl in a pig mask. The girl in the pig mask comes up to them. And after some pretty bad rolls, both Gil and Jay have something taken from them. The J thing will come up later. Pretzel disappears. And this is when Gillian Tidrider fucking snaps. I have to put some things up. The Hall of Illusions. And here, I would argue, is also the start of the end. This is when it's just bad thing after bad thing and there is no upkeep. And honestly, I'm having a mental breakdown along with these characters, okay? Gillian loses his mind. Pretzel is a gift that Eden gave him when he was still in the undersea, right? He has had Pretzel with him this entire goddamn time and now she is gone! And he becomes Dark Gillian. And he starts causing a havoc. And what does Jay do? Jay enables him. They go and they try and find some information on how the hell they'll get Pretzel back. And they learn that they should probably try and speak to Mr. Cass, who owns the carnival. Will appear in a few hours when the Big Top hosts an event. So then they're like, Hold on, we have to put on the world's best improv show to get Mr. Cass's attention so we can ask to get Pretzel back. They all now go off to try and find things for an improv show. This can't possibly go bad, I say. In this time, Gillian has a breakdown. Jay becomes a tiny pixie. Chip shakes the hand of a mysterious stranger and gets a deck of cards. This deck of cards, my fellow D&D players, is the deck of many things. This is not going to end well. For those who do not know, the deck of many things is an object you as a DM can give to your players. Players will draw a card 
and you'll have to, you know, whatever that card says will happen. You can see where this is going, can't you? You can see the long-term repercussions this deck of cards will have on this entire campaign. They then go and put on their improv show. The improv show. Many things happen, including Gillian giving birth, a classic, Gillian picks a card up. This card means that Felipe suddenly absolutely despises Gillian. This was after they bonded. This was after Gillian promised Felipe that he would be the second chosen one if Gillian were to die. Gillian picks up the second goddamn card. Gillian picks up the second fucking card and what is it? It's Dungeon. The card is Dungeon. For those who do not know, Dungeon means that the player disappears, right? Fucking disappears, leaves everything behind and goes to a bubble in a different fucking plane of existence until someone casts a plane shifting spell to get them out. Dungeon means Gillian fucking Tidestrider is going to be trapped in his own personal hell for the foreseeable future. When I said this was the, the start of the end, I wasn't joking. I was not lying to you, I was not fabricating the truth. This is real. This is so real. Gilly- Slow burn angst. In brackets. Dungeon. Gillian disappears. But they do get the attention of Mr. Cass. And you know what? Chip and Jay go and talk to Mr. Cass. Mr. Cass explains that they have been trapped here in the Feywild for a while. Usually this carnival travels around. However, Mr. Cass has lost his friend Celestine and mentions that the girl in the pig mask, like the, the place behind the mirrors in the Hall of Illusions, is this, is this plane. And so they're like, can we get Gillian and Pretzel back here? And he's like, I don't know, maybe, but Celestine can probably help you. Now Chip's getting a bit pissy at this point. Mr. Cass gives them Gooblek. Gooblek is the stand-in for Gillian for Charlie Sun's Good to Play while Gillian is Gilly gone. Gooblek is a plasmoid who worked for Mr. Cass at Cass's carnival. They enter these mirrors and they find themselves in a secondary dimension. There's a bunch of like rooms and little tasks that they go through. There's one that's like a school, one that is like, like a, you know, a, a nuclear family house kind of situation. And then it's in this environment that we learn what Jay lost. Jay lost her ability to read. We find this character called the puppeteer. They fight the puppeteer. Puppeteer looks pretty damn sick, I'm not gonna lie. They find pretzel. They find a marketable pretzel plushie. Pretzel has become marketable. We learn that Gooblek can like absorb people and then absorbs their memories. Gooblek does absorb the puppeteer, okay? And they keep going through these rooms. They do these little, little games and little tricks and all this time, you know, Chip is slowly breaking down as he's lost Gillian and he blames himself. Jay is slowly breaking down because they've lost Gillian and she blames herself and Gooblek is hee-hooing all over the place and Felipe is kind of just there. We have to go and find this person called the Doctor. The Doctor is the one who has taken over Celestine's plane. Before then, Chip and Jay have a little bit of a sit down. Here they finally break down about Gillian and this is a really nice scene, I'm not gonna lie. I've been a bit angry for the past 20 minutes as I've been explaining this arc, but this scene is very nice and very tender. However, some insanely out of pocket things are said. Okay, so firstly, Chip has a bit of a breakdown, obviously, over Gillian. Chip starts talking about how they're not going to get Gillian back, or like they are going to get Gillian back, like they, you know, like Ollie's going to go home, like they're going to get Arlen back and that Arlen's alive. You know, he really, he's a bit of a Debbie Downer. He does say, it's my fault. It's always my fault. Which apart from tearing my heart out and letting me shit it out on the ground, um, very much shows where Chip is mentally at this point and how he's had a bit of like a reality check and he's very much starting to realize that this entire journey that they have been on, this entire journey that they have been on has kind of just been nothing. And then Jay says the most out of pocket shit, okay? Jay does not reassure Chip. She does not be like, no, this dude did not do that. She says, I hope you can forgive yourself. Jay, my darling, my dearest, I love you. But what the fuck is this? Okay, I thought you were one of the fucking boys. And apparently you're not. And they confront the witch doctor. Now, <laughs> the witch doctor also has a very cool design. All I really feel the need to tell you is that the witch doctor has nipple rings. 
Thank you, Grizzly, for that one. They see the Doctor, and the Doctor pretty much explains that Gublek here is one of his experiments, and that is the ideal race. Getting to a bit of a saucy zone. He wants everyone to be Gublek because then they can be, like, you know, superior, and, you know, you don't have to do any of the human dying and pain and anguish. And he reveals that Gublek eats people for him to get their power. Gublek has eaten 91 people so far. Also during this, he kind of explains that his home world was overtaken by this black sludge. Black sludge, are we seeing a pattern here? Jay accidentally mentions that their home world mana is very powerful and that there are a lot of powerful people there. And so instead of killing this guy, instead he hears about mana and decides he's going to go there to take all of their power. Celestine is in fact there. She is there. Um, she's in a kind of a coma state at the minute. And so once the witch doctor goes, they manage to wake Celestine up. I am going to take a quick pause here to divert your attention to Gillian Tystrider. I'm going to put up here in the plot Gil's dungeon. Because whilst all of this has been happening, Gillian has been in pretty much a black void and he has been reliving his past trauma. We are introduced to Gillian in his dungeon, which is just his black void. And in front of him are these four fuzzy figures, which we learn are manifestations of the Elder Council. The Elder Council, if you guys don't remember, is Gillian's like superiors. They're the ones who told him he's a chosen one and like trained him his entire life, right? And so they are telling him that they are putting him on trial. This trial is to assess whether he really is worthy to be the chosen one. And he has to go through a set of three trials. The first trial is he is given all these trials are pretty much stuff that he has had to do in his training, right? And it's like to see if he's going to make different or the same choices. And it's not made clear which one is correct. You know, like if the elders want him to make the same choice or a different choice. Gil is presented with this camp of sleeping soldiers and is presented the option. Usually he would just kill them, right? Instead, this situation, he wakes them up and tries to talk to them. Again, it's not made clear whether this is the right or the wrong choice. The next trial he has to go through is one where he is fighting himself. He is fighting himself from many, many years ago when he was a lot more destiny driven and a lot more indoctrinated by the elders. And he fights himself over like exploding a city. And then the third trial, the most important trial, which is why I kind of rushed through the other two, was his banishment day. Gil is presented with the scene of the day that he was banished from the undersea. So he opens these double doors and sees Jason Farron, um, a few of the Elder Council and other Navy soldiers. And back when he first lived this experience, he burst open the doors and just killed one of the Navy soldiers, right? This time he comes in steadily and sits down. He, it's obvious here that the Navy are trying to make a deal with the undersea, some sort of political deal. Jason Farron presents his points or whatever, and Gil stands up and explains to the people of the undersea and the elder council that what is in front of them, the navy in front of them, is not the personification of the best parts of the overseas, that there are real good people in the overseas, and that Jason Farron and his navy are not some of them. He stands up and he delivers the most pussy popping speech. I have ever heard until about two minutes later when he presents an even better one. He presents his speech and he is taken out of this simulation and he is put back into his dungeon. And in front of him again are the Elder Council. They say pretty much before your trial is over, before we make your assessment, is there anything you would like to say? Is there any last sins you would like to admit to? Gillian Tidestrider, champion of the undersea, hero of the deep, co-captain of the Riptide Pirates stands up in front of the Elders of the Undersea and provides the most insane speech I have ever heard in my entire life. He stands there and admits to these motherfuckers that they ruined his entire childhood. They, he admits, he says to them, he tells them no less, that they raised him to be a weapon and that he will not stand there and do that anymore. That he will fight for his own destiny, not as the blade they sharpened, but as his own person. He 
he he screams at them that he hates that they put him through all that training that they took his childhood away from him my secret is that i hate you this is all the bits of paper that we have for the wall today however it does not mean that i am necessarily finished as we close out on that pussy popping speech there's a bit more and I don't have paper for it because the episode literally came out yesterday and I don't have a printer here and I'm not going to print out or write any more script. This is coming just straight off the fucking dome. I don't have any paper so I'm sorry about that. And just as the elders of the undersea are about to give him his verdict, the sky fucking rips open and one green eye looks down at him and who fucking is it? Take your guesses. Take your guesses. Five, four, three, two, one. It's Niklaus fucking Hendrix, boys. E is back and he is ready to do business. He looks down and he says, Tut, tut, tut. Can't have you dying before I got my deal, Gillian. We had a spoiler ban. We couldn't talk about this shit for two weeks. So now we're up to episode 81. This is the final episode currently published at the time of recording of Riptide. Probably episode... 82, maybe 83 will be out by the time you guys watch this, and I'm sorry, okay? But I'm working on a bit of a schedule here. Maybe there'll be a part two in the future when Riptide is over, but for now, this is what you're getting. We come back over to Chip and Jay. They are talking to Celestine, who wakes up, and she pretty much says, thank you so much for waking me up. Um, I've taken back over my domain. Is there anything you guys want as a thank you? Chip basically says, I want Gillian back. She's like, I cannot see Gillian. He is in a place or with someone who is protecting him magically. Jay then asks, hey, remember Apple the bird? Who actually isn't really a bird? From all the way back here, remember this? Yeah, can you turn her back to not a bird? And then the fucking mirror next to Celestine is like, well, actually, this is a super magical, powerful spell that has been cast over literally a hundred years. Um, so yeah, I can turn her back, but who the fuck is she? And then Chip and Jay are like, hold on, what if Apple wanted to be Apple, and this is a super powerful magic caster that wanted to be turned into a bird? So they decided to make sure they had the bird's fucking consent? before turning it back into not a bird, and so they actually didn't solve the apple issue either. Celestine gave them a potion bottle, is like, use this, turn apple, not into a bird. It is time sensitive though, right? So we came all this way for Gillian, and we came all this way for apple. And we are leaving here, having not solved the Gillian issue and having not solved the apple issue. Do you see my debacle? Do you see the issue here? Jay's like, one last thing. Can you check on Niklaus Hendricks for me? Into the fucking mind's eye, right? Third eye vision. Niklaus Hendricks. He's sitting on the fucking mast of the albatross. Sir? King? The fuck did you do? How did you get there? And they're like, okay, great. Can we go back now? Can we go back and, uh, you know, to our ship and to our crew who have just fucking abandoned for God knows how long because time works different in the Feywild. Gublik is like, great. Get in me and I can transport you back. Chip and Jay get in Gublek. Felipe gets in Gublek. They are all transported dimensionally back to Mana. Gublek doesn't go with them. He stays here with Celestine. By the way, they did also talk to Cass, who came back here, and Celestine asked Cass to keep an eye on the Riptide Pirates just in case. Chip and Jay are back on Mana, back at Liquidus, and Niklaus is nowhere to be seen. He's not on the ship. Now, they're kind of, tr they're, they're freaking out a little bit. Well, we haven't solved any issue yet. We have Pretzel back. She's now back. She is a full Pretzel again, not marketable anymore. What did we ask our crew to do while we were away? Make a Limonade Empire. They've come back. And they have fucking Lorax thanated this bitch up, okay? Ollie, bam. Alphonse, bam. Griffin. Bam. They have made a limonade empire. They have created a drink so magical that the entire town is fucking in on this shit. Good news, however, it's only been two weeks since, this, since they disappeared. Chip realizes that they don't need him. Seeing Ollie, especially Ollie, here like this, in his element, they're a well-oiled machine, you know, they're making a little limonade, 
he realizes that he isn't needed, that they don't rely on him. And so he walks back to the ship and Jay follows. Jay comes up to him and is like, yo, what's wrong? And Chip pretty much says, we're gonna get Gillian back. We're gonna get Ollie home and then I'm done. And then Jay is like, okay, if you're gonna take responsibility for that stuff, take responsibility for other things as well, such as, the fact that I am now here and happy. The fact that I got to leave my life of the Navy and now I get to live with this cool ass pirate crew. And Chip is like, nah, you cannot convince me. We still don't have Gillian. And Jay is like, Gillian would think the same thing. And he would be like, no. He leaves. Jay, sitting on the boat alone, is confronted by Desire Daddy himself. He comes to Jay and is like, hey, do you want to make a deal? And Jay is like, the fuck not? And he is like, well, you need Gillian back, don't you? And then Jay is like, yeah, but I'll find him without you. And then Niklaus is like, no, you won't. As the final episode, currently aired, of Just Roll With It Riptide closes out, Jay Ferrin makes a deal with Niklaus. She makes a deal that at some point in the future, Niklaus will say a name. And that name will be followed by an action or a command. And whatever it is, she has to do it. As long as that command does not injure Gillian or Chip. In return, she is given the Luxbris Pearl. Remember that motherfucker? The Luxbris Pearl from like Joaldo? The Luxbris Pearl. She gets that. And she is told that that is Gillian's dungeon. That he is in there. And that tomorrow, big storm is going to happen. Have to let it be struck by lightning, and once that happens, Gillian will be back. That, my friends, is all of Just Roll With It Riptide explained to you over the series of five hours. That's it, everybody. Thank you for watching if you made it this far. That's literally insane if you did. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this all makes sense. Um, if you are here and you haven't watched uh, Just Roll With It Riptide or any of Just Roll With It, um, please do if you like this. If you made it this far, I'm assuming you have. It's really good. It's fantastic. It's hilarious. And I didn't include nearly as many funny moments as there are. You know the drill. Check out Just Draw With It on Patreon. They have two exclusive campaigns, Prime Defenders and um, Apotheosis. That's pretty much it. Subscribe if you want to, I guess. I can't promise I'll be making any more videos. I don't really know if I have time or if I want to. This was kind of just a project I wanted to do because I thought it would be funny. I hope it is funny. I hope you liked my mini microphone. I really liked my mini microphone. Uh, with that, read you guest nation, gamers, gamees, and everything in between, poggers and pog champs. <sighs> Thank you for watching. And I guess we'll just have to roll with it. <laughs>